Welcome to season nine of the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone. We are nearing the end of our season nine. I can't believe it. 2020 has been quite the year. Um, I, I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I, I can't say that I'm real sad to see it coming to an end. That said, I'm thrilled about this week's podcast guest, and I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. But before I bring Magnus Gustafsson on, I want to just remind you guys, if you haven't already, we'd love to have you become a member of ParentingAces.com by going to our website and clicking on the little join icon on the left side of the page. We have lots of options for you. You can be a free member. You can be a monthly member, an annual member. And for you coaches out there, we have a nice discount for you too. So no excuses. We hope you'll join us. Also, since we are coming to the end of our season, I do want to just put a plug out there for all of our episodes of season nine. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to all of them, maybe you missed one or two, now's a great time to play catch up. So I hope you'll go back through the archives on whatever your favorite podcast app is and have a listen. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about this week's guest, Magnus Gustafsson, and I'm, I hope I'm saying his name properly, uh, lives in Sweden. He is a former top ATP touring pro. He grew up in a tennis family, and I'm gonna let him tell us a little bit more about that. But he currently is running a really unique program in his home country to bring more families and particularly more children into the sport of tennis. This isn't just working in a vacuum. Uh, Magnus grew up in, as I said, a tennis family. Giving back to the community has been a part of his DNA since birth, it seems. So it's really cool that He's kind of using his background in the sport to do something really positive, not only for his community and his country of Sweden, but also for the sport of tennis overall. And the way I got connected to him is through a member of the Parenting Aces community, of course. Um, a tennis parent had reached out to me about the work that Magnus is doing and said, you know, I think he'd make a great podcast guest. You really ought to chat with him. So Luke, thank you for that. That. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Magnus on. Let me get him on screen. Magnus, hello. Welcome to the podcast. So thrilled to get to talk to you. Thank you very much. I really love to talk about tennis. So I'm, I'm honored to be here. Well, and, and I don't know if you prefer that I call you Magnus or call you Gustan, which is your nickname. And there's a good story behind that that I want you to share with us. But what what would you prefer to be called? Yeah, that whatever sounds better. <laughs> hey, you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start. I'm going to call you Magnus because we don't know each other very well yet. Um, can we start by having you tell us a little bit about how you got started playing tennis and a little bit about how your family is involved in the sport? Right. Uh, no, uh, I'm, fi I'm 53 years old and uh, I grew up with uh, tennis when I was uh, six, seven years old. Um, in Sweden, Björn Borg was the big hero, uh, of course, and uh, it was when he was, you know, winning all this uh, championship in Wimbledon and French Open and it was number one in the world, all the Swedish population uh, wanted to play tennis. We were watching that on the television. It was only two channels in, in Sweden at that time and it was channel one and channel two. And when B Borg was playing, everybody was watching that. So I was for sure not an exception and uh, my parents uh, also loved to see Borg. So my family together with another 30, 40 families uh made a tennis court in the area where we were uh living and uh all the kids uh, started to play on that court as well and uh, when they, it was busy on that court we had a small road when we were painting with the lines with the chalk and and uh, had a piece of string and we put that as a net and then we were playing a lot of mini tennis so that's where it all started 
That's fantastic. And and that chalked court with the string, we're seeing that with COVID or we were a few months ago when all the tennis facilities were closed. We saw lots of video of kids and adults alike, you know, creating tennis courts out on their driveways, out on their streets. So um, this is this is something that dates way back. And I love that kids were doing that in your hometown. Sweden gets pretty cold. Was this tennis court that you're that the families built indoors or outdoors? It was outdoors. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so you started playing at a young age. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your parents were involved in your own tennis development as a kid? Yeah. Uh, when I started with tennis, I played a lot of other sports as well. I was playing soccer I, I tried ice hockey i i did something that we do in sweden called orienteering uh track and field all kind of sports actually uh but as older i got as uh, as less sports i i was do, doing so when at the age of i would say 13 14 it was only soccer and tennis and um, then then the choice was easy because i had m most of my friends they were playing tennis uh, all over uh, Sweden, so um, uh, th that's why I was was choosing tennis. My parents they were very supportive uh, uh, outside the court. They were driving me to the tennis club. Uh, they, my mother. I had some funny stories with my mother. She 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 was not really much into sport, but she supported me in, in her way. And uh, I remember, for example, uh, when I was playing um, Stockholm Open, uh, a huge uh, super uh, thousand tournament. At that time, one of the biggest tournaments in the world. Uh, and uh, I was uh, playing in front of my home crowd. 18,000 people and I was so nervous before entering the court because it was dark and the only thing that was light on, it was on me when I was walking into the court. And then I got even more nervous. Um, but then when they turned up the whole arena, I was watching my parents and then I saw my mom, she was knitting a, a shirt, something like that. and uh, and And it was a kind of sign to me to say that have fun and 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 uh, and uh, yeah play and have fun and and that's it my father she, he was more nervous when i was playing and i could see that also uh when he was moving his feet when he was sitting like there and that and that but he was he and my mother never pushed me but they tried to help me uh, a lot uh, in, in, in other ways. And I, uh, I, all, I never uh, forget, for example, when my father, because when I was 13, 14, I had a lot of technical problem with my backhand and I had nightmares because I couldn't hit backhand uh, and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And, 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 uh, and then one day I was, trying to sleep. It was late night and I was just going to fall asleep and so on. And then my father come, is coming into my room and saying, now I have it. I was reading Stan Smith's uh, training tips or whatever. And <laughs> you should hit the back end. And that, that made, me, made me sleepless instead of, you know, uh, <laughs> that I could fall asleep. And after that, I was talking to my father and saying that, me, my coach is taking care of that. Uh, I'm very glad that you support me with driving me to the uh, tennis tournaments, to, to the clubs, and so on. Uh, and uh, and after that, he, yeah, he, I could feel that he supported me, but uh, he did it in a in in a way that I wanted it, and so on. So my my parents, I have to say that they have always been very good to me and. If I wanted to play soccer, they said, play soccer. If I wanted to play tennis, play tennis and so on. So it was always from inside, from myself. Uh, yeah, if you understand what I mean there. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I, you know, for parents nowadays who have access to so much information, whether it's YouTube videos or websites or, you know, 
podcasts like this, um, it's very easy to kind of think that you can coach your own child and, you know, tweak things in their game like your dad did by reading a book. But I guess the message, the takeaway is that even at age 13, 14, you understood that there was a role for your dad and your mom and there was a role for your coach. And those two things needed to stay rather separate. Exactly, exactly. And it's pretty fascinating with this uh, YouTube and everything like this because I have three kids now and my middle uh, uh, the kids, uh, second uh, child, he's 15 years old. He's playing a lot of tennis. Uh, and I have my youngest one, he's eight years old. And my eight year old kid, he's, he's practicing one hour per week. Um, and uh, then he's playing a little bit with his friends once uh, per week in the weekends and so on. And I, I never coach him. And the coach that, uh, oh, well, he's, it's four p players in his group. And he doesn't really coach them and so on. But I see that he's improving a lot. While my other kid, who is 15 years old now, he was more coached and so on. A little bit by me, but for sure more with 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 the uh, no with other coaches and still this uh, my eight years old he's improving and i said well, how can he improve but then i understood that he's seeing a lot from the youtube he's getting it from the youtube which is fascinating that yeah. that, that they can learn it from there <laughs> so it's the wave of pandemic year right i mean yeah. everything's being done online, instruction, interviews, everything's being done yeah. through video technology. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just the, the age we live in. It's kind of mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. So when you, you played on the tour for several years, you had some great success. You had some big wins. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, yeah, I, one of your wins was over my friend Tim Mayotte. I read that on the <laughs> ATP website. <laughs> my regards to Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But then you decided to retire, but you stayed on the tour quite a while. What was the impetus behind your retirement from professional tennis? I retired when I was, I was supposed to turn 35. And at that time, I, fi I felt like a dinosaur <laughs> actually on the tour because I was... That was old then. It was very old then. That Federer keeps on playing until he's probably going to be 40 years old. It's amazing because that time I could feel my body that I was I was tired I had problem with my shoulder my knees I had made eight surgeries uh, up to that wow. uh, that time and I felt that I, I I had my best times behind me that I could feel a lot I still like to be on the tour but I felt that uh, am I go on when I'm not top 100 uh, and am I gonna go on to get more injured and so on it was not worth it but nowadays I think they can take more care of the body because I didn't have any have any physio for example right who was traveling with me until the last years uh, and and that helps them to keep fit for for many more years sure and now, also they have a breakthrough a little bit later than we had I had a breakthrough when I was 20 and that was pretty late at yeah. that time compared to other Swedish players. So uh, so that I played for al almost uh, yeah, around 15, 16 years on the tour and that was a long, long career. Yeah, for sure. Even while you were playing, you had a commitment to bringing tennis to the young people in your country. And you started programs and things even while you were still on tour. But in recent years, you've really upped that commitment with your small champs program. And yeah. I'd really love for you to share with the Parenting Aces audience mm -hmm. why you started small champs and some of the details behind it, because I we don't have anything on a large scale like that here in the States, though there are people doing similar work in small, you know, in communities around the country, uh, but there's nothing organized on a national level that sounds like what you're doing with small champs. So um, tell us about that. Yeah. 
Um, I, as I said, I have a, a child. Uh, he's 15 years old. And uh, when he was seven years old, he was playing one hour uh, of soccer per week. Then he was playing one hour of tennis per week, and one hour per, uh, per week with table tennis. And uh, soccer was number one, table tennis was number two, and tennis was the most boring sport I could <laughs> So uh, I was thinking why I started to play tennis, why I kept on playing tennis. And I said that now I wanted to give him the same journey as I had because I had the most unbelievable journey with my, my tennis career since I was seven years old until I, I quit, until was, I was 35. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give him the same. Uh, so what I did, I called uh, a lot of coaches in the Gothenburg area. In Sweden, is working a lot with, with clubs and so on. And it's a little bit other system that you have in, in the States. Uh, and, and I asked the coaches if they had any uh, kid in the age, the same age as, uh, as my kid, could be one year younger, could be one year older, but not, not more than that. It didn't matter really if they were really good or bad. The, the most important was that they should like competition. Uh, because uh, small champs is all about competing in, in a good way, I would say. So the first time we met was um, uh, at the tennis club in Sweden. We met for three hours and we did all kind. I was dividing them in, in two teams. I think we were 16 uh, kids from the beginning. Uh, so, uh, so two teams. Uh, and the blue team and the red team. And uh, then we were competing in, in um, uh, around the world. We were competing in, uh, in, in soccer. We were competing in a, a Swedish uh, called floorball. Uh, and, and of course in tennis, uh, singles, doubles, everything. And for each time, I mean, if, Two kids played against two other kids. They got one point for the team. If they won around the world, they got one point for the team and so on. And after that evening, when me and my son was driving home, he said so many times, Dad, you have to stop the car. We have to go back. We have to do this more and more and, and so on. And after that day, tennis was his number one sport. And I called the other parents and they had exactly the same impressions from their kids. So we, we, we kept on doing this. First, we did it uh, every month. So I have to say this is, this is a compliment. Uh, this is uh, club tennis. It's their DNA. This is the, their base. Mm -hmm. But this is something for, uh, what do you say, compliment for, for the club tennis. Uh, and, and so we did it w once per month. And um, and more and more kids and parents started to call if they could join the group. So we, we, we got 30 kids. And after that, I said, Phew, now it's tough. Uh, we have to have other groups uh, now. So we started more and more groups. And what we, what we did was that we tried to do it more frequently. We did also uh, soccer matches, ice hockey matches, uh, floorball matches against real team. And uh, the kids got more and more closer to, to each other. Uh, nowadays, with this you, Instagram and Facebook and all these kind of things that you are using, that made them also come very close to each other every day, on a daily basis, even if, uh, if, even if they were not neighbors. Because when I grew up, it was tougher to, if a kid were living 10 kilometers from there, it was tough to see him or to hear from him daily. But this kid, they got so close to each other and we went to tournaments and so on. We went together, warming up together and did everything together. And, and um, all those kids, those 30 kids, uh, I would say that 23, 24, are still playing tennis 
and the rest are doing other sports. And that's wow. my that was my goal to okay, I hope they stay with tennis, but if they stay with sports, that's then I I think I've done something because the average in quitting a sport in Sweden nowadays is ten and a half years old. Ten and a half years old. So you start and you stop almost immediately. And now they are 15, 16, almost everybody keep on playing tennis or other sports. And I think I think we have achieved something very good. Now. Yeah, for sure. And what I find so interesting about this is that you were able to get, you were a coach yourself at that point or just a parent? Just uh, a parent. I, I was <laughs> Sorry. Really, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was not really a coach. Uh, I, I would say that I was the one who was may, may, making competitions with them the whole time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't learn them to hit forehand and backhand and so on. The, the club coach took care of that. Because if I was going to tell them, oh, you have to hit the four and there, and the club coach is saying something else, that will just confuse them. Mm -hmm. So I was the guy who was making the fun competitions and to try to get the kids together. And my other um, uh, things that I did was talking to the parents, for example, how I felt when I grew up, I was talking about my parents. I was inviting other parents who was talking uh, 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 other parents who have had kids in tennis before, in soccer before, how they have experienced their careers uh, with their parents and uh, what what they did good, what they did bad, what kid could they have done better how, and, and, and so on. So we got a very good community with with the parents as well. Uh, and and uh, because in Sweden anyway, it's it's very difficult if you haven't been in the tennis sport, how to act, how to which tournaments shall they play? Everywhere, uh, it's difficult sorry. everywhere, Magnus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's probably everywhere. That's why and, we're uh, here. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but this is things that you take for granted as a tennis player, or maybe tennis coach, or maybe even tennis club, but. Uh, but but if you don't uh, learn them or tell them how it is, how shall they know and so on? And the problem starts when parents start to teach parents how it should be. Oh, my kid is playing four times a week. Oh, then I have to, then my kids have to play five hours per week or 10 hours per week. And you know, it's getting worse and worse there. So the best is that the club or yeah, maybe someone like me or someone who has been there can tell them that, yeah, what what I believe in anyway. Maybe this is not right, but I believe in this because I, I, I had a very, I had fun my whole career. Even if I had good result as well, I had fun, and everything came inside me. Uh, from I really wanted to play tennis myself, and I wanted to compete, and I wanted these things, and I think this is something that. That, to, that the tennis society was creating to me and so on, and all the players and coaches around that we were creating at the 70s and 80s. And it's a little bit different here uh, with the Swedish uh, tennis society as it was uh, before. Sure, sure. One thing that I find, you know, so kind of inspiring about all of this is how you have gotten other parents involved and these other parents are now running these small champs groups, you know, yeah. and, and you still, you've maintained this notion of the importance of having the kids be within a year or two of each other age wise so that there's a social connection, right. And you yes. feed into that need of children to be with other children. Yes. Um, but also, this whole idea of having the parents contribute in a way that it's not a tournament. It's not for ranking points or rating points or money or opportunity. Even it's more about just bringing the kids together to foster that love of not only tennis, but of competition in general. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what it's all about. And as I said before, that's how I grew up. Uh, I used to say to 
to the kids. Uh, how do you do your best friend? How, how do you make your best friend to better tennis player? And I'll say the same to the uh, to the parents. How do you do your your son or your daughter's best friend to be a tennis player or to, to be a person and so on? And and um, as I said before, when we were thirty kids in my group, I couldn't I couldn't take anymore because in in here in Gothenburg area the, we have two indoor facilities that the, that we have more than six courts and if you're more than 30 kids it's it's tough to have tennis uh, to, to make exercises when you're five six uh, kids on the court uh so i divided it in more groups and so on and and what i did was that i was helping uh the parents to uh, to to yeah to give them this kind of uh, schedule that i had every evening or or uh making them yeah t told them that yeah you can call uh, this stockholm club and then you can play against them and you can call this uh, uh, soccer uh, club and you can play against them so th they were just copying copying what i was doing and of course i was in trying to inspire them and so on but then they saw it it was working and some parents they thought it they needed to be very good tennis player to have this kind of events but but uh, the only th only thing that, that they sh should uh, know is um, uh, is what kind of competition can we have today and how can we inspire the kids and what is very very important for me is to sit with the kids before every time we see each other five minutes or ten minutes before and talk about what, what uh, how we respect each other uh, that the result is not the most important uh, that someone is bigger than the others and that makes them uh, hit harder and and that someone is developing a little bit later and so on and this kind of things if you talk with the kids the whole time and try to uh, make them understand how important it is to support each other then slowly slowly the group is coming more and more and more together and you know the, i don't know how it is in in the states but in, in sweden it is that if you're playing one hour of tennis it is like oh it's five o'clock now you you start your tennis session you learn forehand you learn backhand you learn serve and everything like this but you don't have the time to talk with the kids before and so on and that is so important. And also afterwards, five minutes, what did we do good today? How did we uh, treat each other today? Uh, how did we support each other? Uh, and, and so it's getting better. So it was getting better time after time after time. And now when the first group, they are 15, 16 years old, in my world anyway, they are fantastic ambassadors of uh, uh, te uh, uh, for, for a tennis player on the court outside the court and i hate to i hate to talk about results but if if someone uh, if i should say something there are 10 or 15 of them they are top the top in sweden and even in, in europe uh, now so we have done something right anyway i think both well and outside the court yeah right and what you've done is created this blueprint that now you're sharing with other parents to help them run these groups too because as you said it's growing it's more than one person can handle on one set of courts but the other piece of it that i think is so interesting is the fact that you've had buy-in from clubs all around you that are saying, you know, yes, I we support our players going to this other program that we're not making any money from it. You know, it's it's not benefiting our club per se, but it's a way for our members, our kids to learn the sport in a great way to foster their love of competition, to grow the sport, to be positive ambassadors for the sport, as you're saying. Yeah. And the clubs have kind of gotten over themselves. You know, they're not so stuck on 
well, you know, we can't risk a kid jumping ship and moving to another club or another coach. No, they're, they're, they're cooperating. They're working together to build the sport, to grow the sport because they see the bigger picture here. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. I think it's exactly correct. They're seeing it in a big picture. They're seeing it in the long run. Before, uh, I think they are looking just for what is happening in, in half a year or whatever. Here, I can see that uh, the kids, they are still into tennis, for sure. Many of them are going to be tennis teachers. They're going to uh, play tennis when they're older and so on. And the interest of tennis here in this area, Gothenburg, where we have most uh, 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 small champs, it's it's so much bigger than it was before and of, co of course that will affect in the future tennis to the positive way right and so what happens is you've got these kids that start when they're seven eight years old and then maybe they have younger brothers and sisters who see what big brother big yeah. sister is doing yeah. and want to get involved too so you've been doing this long enough now it seems that you're having maybe the the younger sibling and maybe two younger siblings um, get involved. And by the second or third kid, the parent now really has a clear understanding of what this is all about and can get involved and, and hopefully run groups as well. And, and that's what Luke was telling me. He's running a group of eight, nine year olds. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What it looks like when it's not you running the group, but rather somebody else, what is your involvement, you know, at that level? Uh, yeah, as I said before, I try to inspire them to, to, to take the step of doing it themselves. Uh, I give them some inspiration of doing some competitions that I'll, I know that the, the kids like, like French games and uh, dingles, as we call it, and some other things that I'm 100% sure that the, the kids like and so on. Uh, but also, uh, we we try to make the parents understand. Try to make the parents understand also that it's all up to them if if it's going to be uh, uh, some um, uh, some some training and so on, and some uh, uh, if if they're going to meet uh, because uh, we we. Well, I, one of the mistakes that I did was that we, we started to do the same in, in, in the Stockholm area. We started with six groups. I think it was around uh, 100, 110 uh, uh, kids there. And um, I took it a little bit for granted that the, the parents should be running uh, the group, but that I should say that, okay, you can do that this and this and this, and then, then, then it will run. <laughs> but... Uh, I think you have to support also a little bit uh, the, the, the parents uh, who, who are running the groups, yeah. uh, even after one month and two months and so on. Uh, but um, but Luke, for example, he, he's a he's an unbelievable guy. That it was enough to talk to him for for an hour, and then he understood everything. But he he has so much energy. He has so much ideas himself. Uh, so. so so he's running the, those groups that he's having unbelievable good. But some parents, they need a little bit of support here and a little bit of support there. Sure. And then all of a sudden, it starts running and they see the results, what, what uh, on the court and off the court, and the, 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 the player really love the tennis. So, uh, so they get more and more into it. And it's the same in our group as I started. We have uh, so many parents who, who have helped me with so many things there also. Uh, so from the beginning, it was only me. But uh, as long as it rolled, as more help I got from, from all the other parents as well. So do you do regular check-ins with the parents that are running the various groups? Like, do you all have a monthly Zoom meeting or an email, something that's happening? How do you kind of keep tabs on the different groups and how they're running? Yeah, I should uh, do it. Uh, up till uh, uh, this summer, we had around uh, here in Gothenburg area around 
130 kids or 140 kids. Wow. But after the summer, we, we started seven new groups, another 130 uh, kids. Uh, and uh, and uh, now I got some help also now from uh, Tennis Gothenburg uh, that uh, got into this, this as well because they see that uh, with the effect with the tennis here in, in, in Gothenburg that is, is helping them. Uh, so I think we're going to uh, have more meeting with, with the group leaders and, and so on. And uh, uh, that we learn from each other uh, mm -hmm. because I learn from them <laughs> and sure. from me. So we learn from each other what, what, what we have made good, what we can do better and so on. And, and also we have had this conversation with the clubs as well, uh, a lot with the tennis coaches, uh, the same there. I can help them and they can help me as well. So um, this, this conversation is very important. So we all see that we are doing this together uh, and, and so on. And the success is getting more fun also, as more we are. <laughs> what has been your biggest challenge with growing small champs? No, I think uh, I learned a lesson when we started these groups in Stockholm that I took it for granted, as I said, that that uh, if we have a group leader and if I uh, give them instruction what they can do and so on, it's it's so easy. I, I mean, in in my world, but but it it wasn't so easy. Uh, pa parents feel also a little bit secure, what to, insecure, what to do. Uh, they, so, some want to do more than is necessary, but as as uh, uh, but as, as a few kids are saying, even if it's not the perfect evening that we have the perfect challenge, or oh, this is feel this, this feels like a heavy birthday party, whatever. They, the kids like it anyway. They like to see the friends. They like to hit balls. They, they one competition there. It. it, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, right. The important thing is that they meet and they hit a lot of balls and they have some competitions and and so on. Uh, and and also the, this these words that they are respecting each other. That they are uh, we, we, they giving when they are uh, doing these uh, uh, sessions and so on. Uh, they have their own roles. <laughs> Uh, so my groups made their own roles, and if one of those roles was that if we're playing on the tennis court, we shall do our best. If we don't do our best, we wait 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And every time uh, uh, I've seen kids, it doesn't happen often because they have so much fun, but when it happens, I ask them, do you want to rest a little bit or not? And most of the time, they they go on and they keep fighting and they, it's, it's so different. But but once in a while it has happened, yeah, uh, I had a lot of soccer practice before, I'm a little bit tired, yeah, but sit down 10 minutes and wait. And then they're coming back after 10 minutes and they're eager again. So yeah. they, have their own, they have created their own roles and when they created their own roles, it's much easier for me to say that, hey, don't forget what you, you told me. Don't you, don't, don't, don't you forget what, what is your own roles right. and so on. So the kids, the kids really have ownership in the program and yeah. your job is to remind them of that and to hold yeah. them accountable yeah. for yeah. The, the rules that they've set for themselves. I love yes. that. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, that, yeah, that is good. And those roles they created when they were 11 years old. And of course, uh, if you have 30 kids, it's, yeah, some of them are a little bit, yeah, they, they, they say some good things and so on. And then I was helping them a little bit with some roles, but they, they, they accept them They're very good. So they have always been very uh, respectful against the rules after that. I love that. How difficult has it been, or maybe easy, has it been for you to recruit parents to run these groups in different places? Uh yeah, it, it has been, as I said, in Stockholm, it was more difficult to, to yeah. recruit them. In, in the Gothenburg area, one thing that we did different this, this time when we were uh, starting six new groups, that we were sitting down with uh, all the parents 
explaining what we expect from them and what uh, how it will be good, uh, what, what, what they need to do to make it good. And it can't be one parent alone who is running it. It has to be two or three who take the responsibility for, uh, for it. But then also explaining to them it's not so difficult to do it because what you have to do is you have to book the courts, you have to have tennis balls, and you have to have a program to follow. And that's about it. You don't need so much more. It's not kind of hocus pocus or something like that. So when, when they understand that, they see it's not so difficult. And one thing which is very good with, with that also, it's, 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 it's very cheap for the, for the parents as well to run this kind of event because they share the cost for the courts, they share the cost for the balls, and that's it. So uh, to, for a three hours event uh, like that, it, it costs them yeah, uh, around uh, $10. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, and yeah, so that, that, that is, is another uh, upside of, uh, of, of this. So there's no coach being paid during these sessions. The parents running the groups are doing it as volunteers. Yeah. You're yeah. doing it as a volunteer. Yeah. Um, and who's making the money is the facility getting paid for the court time. Yeah. But my understanding is even some of the facilities have, have discounted or donated court time to your groups. Yeah. yeah. They are thinking, they, they, they are really now thinking um, that, yeah, for the long run, the big picture and so on, that these kids will come back to the tennis and uh, the parents are more interested. And now when you look, try to book a court in the Gothenburg area is almost impossible because uh, uh, so many, uh, it, it's growing the tennis in, in Gothenburg again. So when we are uh, booking the courts is late Friday evenings and late Saturday evenings, unfortunately. Oh, but uh, it's working uh, anyway. Another piece of this yeah. that I find really fascinating is the fact that you have the kids not only playing tennis, but also playing these other sports, participating yeah. in these other activities. And I don't know how it is in Sweden, but in the States, sometimes tennis is kind of the poor stepchild of the junior sports world. Um, tennis players aren't always given the respect of, you know, let's say our football players, basketball, baseball even. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've seen a level of added respect between these different youth sports teams and players that maybe wasn't there before. For example, if one of your groups goes and plays soccer, do the soccer players come away with thinking, wow, you know, these kids are really good athletes too. You know, tennis is tough. I mean, they've got stamina, they their footwork's amazing. They're getting around yeah. the field and, you know, have you seen any of that? I, did, I don't know what they were thinking, but when we were challenging them in soccer matches and other matches, we we always won, actually. <laughs> so I think they go. have understood that uh, they are pretty good in sports anyway. But what was fascinating me, as I didn't think about before, is that in my group, it was always the best players. He got most respect from the others. Sure. Second best, a lot of respect as well. But then we started to play other sports, ice hockey. And then it was a few from the groups who was not that good in tennis, but they were unbelievable in ice hockey. The other kids start to get respect for them. And then Interesting. We sport and and we, they, some other were good in that. So, the, so it was a way to uh, for the kids to learn what... Uh, that respect could be seen in, a, in another way uh, also. And as we were talking about uh, the word of respect so many times, they, I think they understand that, that as well. But that was very interesting uh, for, for me anyway. And yeah. 
what, what is pretty uh, pretty interesting for me as a leader uh, uh, as well kid is getting uh, uh, crying or sad or because he's losing and so on he used to get uh, the, the parents used to help maybe helps him but sometimes it doesn't work and then I try to help him but sometimes that doesn't work either but it always help when I send some other kid from the group to tell him please can you go to uh, Charlie and help him because he's a little bit sad 15 minutes 15 seconds later Charlie's coming back and he's happy again he's playing so they they learn how to coach each other without knowing it and what is what is pretty interesting also now is that some of the kids now when they're 15 16 they they are helping me also to coach um, uh, when are having these uh, events as well so it's a way of starting to learn to coach as well uh, what, and, what, yeah, yeah. and building compassion i mean what an amazing gift to give these children mm. to ask them to go comfort a teammate and yeah. you know to help them understand the value of showing compassion toward another human being Yes, yes, uh, absolutely, and yeah, it's it's uh, priceless to see uh, when the kid is coming back and is happy, and the other guy, uh, other guy, have helped him and so on. You can't send everybody to to do that, but there is all, always three or four. It was three or four or five in the group that I could send and and uh, to tell them, can you please help him and so on. So, but the rest of the group is watching that, right? They see yeah, that. Are. Absolutely. And yeah. while they may not have that within themselves yet, maybe they're learning through osmosis the value of of building that compassion within themselves. And, you know, maybe they they want to be somebody who is chosen in the future. So maybe it causes some self-reflection. And, you know, even at a young age, kids you know, they understand why certain kids are picked for things and others aren't. And it can it can go one of two ways, right? It can right. reinforce the negative behavior, but it can also spark a desire to to build on the positive behavior. Yes. Yes. Uh, so. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So this hour is going way too fast, Magnus. <laughs> um, so if someone were interested in starting a small champs program, elsewhere outside of sweden yes. what would they need to do to get started are you consulting with people or are you available to help guide people through getting something like this off the ground absolutely i mean i i, I love the sport of tennis uh i i want to want to pay back uh, what i got from from my tennis career and i really believe in this program so much uh, as i can see all the kids how they are how, how much fun they have and so on so uh, and when i when i see tournaments i see some I, I, I see too much of those kids that are too unhappy on the court off the court uh, uh, as, as you said also i think tennis here is the same in sweden we got um, uh, we, 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 I, th I think to be a tennis player, uh, if you're a tennis player, you, they earn respect and so on. And, and sometimes it, it feels like, oh, but the tennis player, blah, blah, blah. And, and also I want to help tennis to, to show everybody how, how good the sport tennis is because it's, it's a really unbelievable sport. So if someone from other countries want to, want to do the same i would absolutely sit down and, and talk about that e over the phone or if they want to come or whatever i'd for sure help them to to, to do something there what's the best way for people to reach out to you yeah you uh, you they can watch our homepage, which is um yeah <laughs> it's uh smalirare uh dot <laughs> 
Okay, so you're going to have to email that one to me so I, I can share to, it. I will email that to you, Lisa, later on, okay. uh, for sure, Perfect. and you can put it on your uh, homepage. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll put it in the show notes to unparentingaces.com. There will be a yes. list there. And um, are you good with me sharing your email address as well? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. absolutely. No problem at all. Okay, great. So those of you watching or listening, make sure you read the show notes and there will be a link to Magnus's website and also to his email if you're interested in getting a small champs program started in your community. Magnus, what else do you want us to know? We're down to our last five minutes or so and, and I want to make sure we've covered everything because I'm I'm so fascinated by the work you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, did we miss something? Um, uh, I, I, I can just tell all the parents that if you have a, a session with three hours with the kids and so on, you have so much energy after that because you see that the kids are so happy after that. We have, for example, had camps. We have had one day, I call it one day camp, when we start nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock in the evening and then in the morning we start and do track and field for example and then we go and eat then we can play a soccer match then we maybe go to the cinema and then we finish with three hours of tennis and what is pretty fascinating is that the kids has been so active during the whole day and when it's nine o'clock in the evening they don't want to stop they want to go on <laughs> So, uh, so you can imagine how much energy it brings you also as a parent or as a leader. It's, it's, it's amazing uh, because you get back so much uh, from the kids. Uh, as I said before, also, it's uh, now when I've been working with them so tight for eight and a half years to see how they have developed, not only as a tennis player, but as a as a person as a human being and with all those words that we've been talking about that's also fascinating uh, so you get a lot a lot back from what you're giving well and one thing too that that we haven't mentioned is the lesson these kids are learning from you magnus and from the other parent leaders which is the value of giving back to your community and this is a lesson that I hope we're all trying to teach our children, right? But through the Small Champs program, you are giving them a physical incarnation of what it means to do community service, to give back, to help others. And the, the fact that through helping others, you also help yourself, right? Mm. You're a better person for the work that you're doing in your community. And yeah. again, this whole notion of not just developing tennis players, but developing good human beings is so important. And especially now, I mean, we're living through a very strange time with the pandemic and, you know, well, I don't know how much you're keeping tabs on what's going on in the States, but we've so just been, <laughs> been through a very difficult election cycle that's not over yet. And so, you know, how do we model this behavior of, you know, that it's important to take care of one another, to give back yeah. to one another. And that's another huge piece of small champs. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And as you say, the society is very diff different nowadays than, than, than it was 30, 40 years ago. Uh, if you look at Swedish tennis player, how some of them, uh, they have been, uh, last years, they have been trying to go their own way the whole time. But that, that always ends up that they stop in an in age of 14, 15, 16 years old when it, when it all started. I have the best teachers ever in Mats Wielander, in Joachim Nyström, the coach John Anders Sjögren, Anders Jared and so on, because they were so much better than me when I, I started on the tour. But when I was playing Australian Open for the first time, I got a phone call from Joachim Nyström and said that, hey, all the guys are going to eat in a restaurant now uh, in the evening as we are uh, 16 guys in the main row of 16 guys there, do you want to join us? And that was the welcome 
to the to the tour uh, for me and i felt either since then i always felt that that i was i was not traveling alone i was tra traveling with, traveling with the swedish tennis national team and we we practice with each other we we uh, gave uh, instructions to each other we we helped each other if, if we're going to play against another opponent and so on so i would never ever have played so long if it wouldn't have been now when i had so many friends it was so much easier for me we had so much to to share the whole time and that was maybe maybe little reason that i stopped because we was not so many uh, swedish on the mm. tour uh when when i stopped uh but i had the the luck to be at the absolutely best time uh, uh, where, where the Swedes were on, on its top. And yeah. that may, made my career so much funnier than it could have been. Well, and the other takeaway from this too is former professional players giving back to the sport, right? And this is something we've been talking a lot about in the States and how to engage our top former players in growing the sport again in the US. And we're seeing a little of that, but not as much as we could see. And I think you are a role model for your fellow professional players in giving back to the sport, uh, bringing your knowledge, your expertise, your experiences to the next generations of players that are coming up. And I think it's just beautiful. Yeah, thanks. Uh, as I said, it's it's my, we all have a different way of thinking what is right or wrong and so on. But uh, as, uh, as I said, I had the most fantastic journey and uh, um, I want to give more <laughs> the same journey uh as, as, as i had so yeah well magnus gustafsson thank you so much for joining us on the parenting aces podcast it's been an absolute pleasure and i look very forward to continuing to follow your small champs program and hopefully see it start to grow here in the states and other countries around the world um i i just think it's it's wonderful what you're doing and and yay <laughs> I, yeah, it's just fantastic. Yeah. To our viewers, if you are listening to this on a podcast app, if you'd like to see the video version, I urge you to go to our YouTube channel and that link will be in the show notes as well. If you want to see Magnus's handsome face coming at you from Sweden, uh, you'll be able to do that on our YouTube channel. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode and we will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.